Hello, and welcome again to The Pastor Study. I'm the pastor, Dave Thomas, lead pastor of Cross of Christ Lutheran Church in beautiful Bellevue, Washington. We're here in my study, and this is the study for the second week in Advent. This is December 6th, 2020, the text for that Sunday, beginning with the lesson from Isaiah chapter 40. Now, here is where we encounter a, a significant move in the uh, book of Isaiah. The first uh, 39 chapters of the book are um, the account of the prophet warning the king and the people of the results, the outcome of their wandering prideful ways. And the result is what we call the Babylonian exile. Chapter 40 picks up in the midst of the exile experience. What's left out in Isaiah, though covered in other parts of the Old Testament, including 2 Kings, is the Babylonian conquest itself, the sacking of Jerusalem, the taking away of the exiles, and the destruction of the first temple. So with that in mind, it is understandable why the second half of the book, or the second book, depending on your scholastic interpretation, uh, first Isaiah and second Isaiah, why here in chapter 40, uh, we begin with the Hebrew word nachamu, which means comfort. Actually, it appears twice. So let's begin our look at this text. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Here is the Hebrew word Elohim, which is generic for God, in contrast with Yahweh, the personal name of God, which will come up in just a moment. Verse 2, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, and that she has received from the Lord's hand, here is um, the, that word, uh, the tetragrammaton, Yahweh, she has received from the hand of Yahweh double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, the Hebrew word here for desert uh, refers to deserts of that region, what um, uh, might be uh, classified as a steep or desert grasslands. This is a large, flat, unforested, um, inariable grassland. The Hebrew word is uh, arava or araba, uh, and you may have guessed already that it is the origin of the word arabia. Arabia, as in Saudi Arabia, and the Arabian Peninsula. So back to our reading. Uh, make straight in the Araba, the Araba, the desert, a highway for our God. Now, obviously, that Hebrew word isn't referring to a paved superhighway that we might uh, have come to our mind when we hear the word highway, but rather it means something more like an, um, a major overland trade route. It would describe the kind of highway, the, the kind of route that was uh, intentionally built, not just developed over time like a footpath, uh, to uh, allow for uh, larger traveling parties, for caravans, for armies, for uh, groups of traders, for carts, and um, for uh, larger vehicles like that. So make straight, uh, make, make in, the, uh, in the desert, uh, a highway, a straight highway. Verse four uh, starts to describe uh, uh, four steps for making that highway. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the uneven ground made level, and the rough places plain. The phrase uneven ground uh, made level literally is uh, crooked places made straight. Uh, this description reminds me of a friend. Uh, actually, a member of the first church that I served after ordination in Arizona. His name is Jim. And Jim was the operations manager uh, for a major construction company that specialized in preparing large lots for really big projects like shopping malls and huge industrial uh, complexes uh, and airports uh, and even um, sports stadiums. Jim had a, a formal title, an impressive title, but um, he called himself a dirt mover. In Isaiah, a lot of dirt has to be moved. But uh, while that um, description is true, literally, uh, if you prepare a highway in the desert, 
Here in Isaiah, it's meant figuratively that low things will be raised up and high things will be brought down. And some things need to be leveled and smoothed out. And the exile experience was an experience of that kind of leveling, of first bringing down the high and haughty, then lifting back up the humbled and repentant. Uneven, unjust, and unfair practices needed to be dealt with. And there were also a lot of rough edges. So this exile experience is a, is a preparing of the way, and the highway then is the people themselves. This was the way that was being cleared for God uh, to trade again with his people, to connect again, uh, to uh, reconnect the wandering wayward people uh, back into relationship with Yahweh. And for them to come freely to God and uh, to have God's glory revealed to them once again, as we are about to hear in verse 5. Then the glory, the Hebrew word is kavod, uh, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. So this is a communal experience. It's not just that all people shall see it, but they shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Verse 6, a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy, that's from the New Revised Standard Version, it's a Fairly unusual word. It means um, having the quality of being faithful or dependable. It's related to constant or consistent. The constancy of the people is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the breath of the Lord, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, and surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord, the word of God, will stand forever. So here, this is referencing to um, God's spoken word, God's declaration, what God speaks. Uh, not a direct reference to a written account, uh, which uh, predates this speaking, this prophecy. Uh, not a direct reference to the Bible, but by extension, God's word um, in written form, uh, God's word passed on, uh, will also stand forever. Verse 9, get you up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God, which would have been a great declaration, which would have been good news for the exiles who hadn't felt like they had seen much of God lately or um, as voiced in Lamentations and some of the Psalms, that God had hidden God's self. Verse 10, see the Lord God comes with might, his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead them like the mother sheep. In the midst of this terrible time, this exile, the people are to be on the lookout for God because God is about to act. And God is about to act both as a mighty ruler, but also as a gentle shepherd. And of course, we on this side of the New Testament here in Isaiah 40, a foreshadowing of John the baptizer who we'll encounter in our gospel lesson, the one called to prepare the way of the Lord. Now we move to the psalm. This is Psalm 85, verses 1 and 2, and again, 8 through 13. This psalm echoes messages of Isaiah 40. God acts to forgive and to restore. God pardons and reconciles with the repentant. God restores harmony and peace. Uh, you might note that we visited this portion of uh, this psalm recently in our little series, Peace Be With You. But it's good to hear again, and this is a little longer reading than we heard several weeks ago. So here you go, verse 1. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sins. God's pardon, uh, as described here, isn't offered with a wink. It's not as if God just looks aside when the people sinned. They paid a high price. Exile, for example. Removal from their homeland. Destruction of their place of worship. God 
deals with sin, both with justice and with mercy. So we move ahead to verse 8. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace. This is shalom. We um, spoke of that in our series, this uh, sense of wholeness, of well-being. God will speak wholeness and well-being to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand. Uh, literally, uh, surely his salvation has come near to those who fear him. This sense of fear we've talked about before isn't um, being terrorized. It means to uh, reverence God, to honor, to respect. Um, surely the salvation of the Lord has come near to those who reverence and respect him, that God's glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Forgiveness and peace will kiss each other. Verse 11, faithfulness and will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. As we pointed out in our Peace Be With You series, righteousness and peace are linked together. Here is an image of uh, them uh, linked, uh, united, joined in a kiss. You can't have peace without righteousness, without justice. But without the goal of peace, then we don't often end up with righteousness, just revenge. Verse 12. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and he will make a path for his steps. More echoes of Isaiah. All right, then we'll move on to the New Testament lesson. This is from um, 2 Peter, verse 8 through 15 of chapter 3. Here we go. Do not ignore the one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like one day. Now that is an often quoted verse. What does it mean? Is it a reference to Psalm 94? For a thousand years in God's sight are but, yet, are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. I think it is. And I think it's also a reference both to the fact that God is not temporally confined as we are. We live in linear time. There is a past, a present, and a future. There's yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God is present in all time. It is always the present for God. And second, it is a reminder that God's timing is perfect. We sometimes feel or think or even complain that God is taking too long, for example, to act. But God is never in a rush, nor is God ever tardy. God always acts right on time. I have um, at home uh, an atomic clock. That is, it is um, set to align itself with uh, Greenwich Mean Time, with perfect time. And uh, it'll get off by seconds or portions of seconds, and it resets its Self to perfect time. I think of that because here we're reminded that God's timing is perfect. And so if there's a disconnect between God's timing and our timing, it's we who need to be reset. We need to realign ourselves, um, sync up with God and not the other way around. It's not God who's already, it's we who are impatient. The writer goes on to say a little bit about that. This is verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So if God is slow, or if Christ is taking his sweet time and returning, it is exactly that. Sweet time. It is sweetness, mercy. It is allowing for more to repent and come or to or, or return to the Lord. And yet it comes with a warning. This time will not go on forever. There is a time to come, the second advent, the return of Christ. Um, and again, the writer of 2 Peter speaks of this. We're in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. And the elements will be dissolved with fire. And the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. And then the writer helps us ask the right question in response, not when, but what and how. What should we be doing? How should we be living? 
Verse 11, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of person ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for the new heaven and the new earth with righteousness, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish and regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. So also our beloved Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. That might be, well, a reference to Romans 2, 6 through 8. He will render to each one according to his works. This is from the pen of Paul. All right, finally, we move on to the gospel this week. It's the beginning of the gospel of uh, Mark. This is chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Uh, and it begins just like that. In the, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, good news here is the Greek word uh, euangelion. Uh, it is a compound word. It means a good message. Uh, it is a good proclamation. This is the beginning of the uh, good news, the gospel, the good proclamation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah. And then quoting our text. See, I am sending my messenger. The word here is angelio. It can be translated angel, but it is literally translated messenger. I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And then we hear about this one who was to accomplish this task. John the baptizer, and in my opinion, that is a better title or descriptor for John, the baptizer, rather than, as we most often hear, John the Baptist. Although technically that's correct. A Baptist means one who baptizes. In the same way as an artist means one who creates art, or an instrumentalist is one who plays an instrument, or a vocalist, or a finalist, or an activist, and all of the other ists. But today, Baptist doesn't necessarily mean one who baptizes, but it connotes a Christian denomination, the denomination of my upbringing, uh, more than the direct act of baptizing. So I most often use the term John the Baptizer, as is used here. Uh, who in our reading continues, uh, appears in the wilderness and proclaims a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So to bookend our little study in Hebrew of Araba, Arabia, from Hebrew, the Greek word here is Eremo. Eremo means an uninhabited land, not suitable for farming. It is, um, has a sense of a place of solitude, of barrenness. Is a place that is deserted, hence desert. So here's a little side note. Um, I'm not a great speller. Uh, spell check fortunately came along just as I was entering uh, professional writing as a journalist. Thank goodness. Uh, but uh, I remember the difference between desert and dessert in this way. Because you might not like the desert. I do. I happen to like the desert very much, the Sonoran Desert of Arizona, the high desert around Yakima. But some people don't love the desert. But who doesn't love dessert and would want more dessert? That's how I remember. Because dessert has two S's, has more. And desert only has one. You're welcome. All right. Back to business. John the Baptizer appears in the desert, this uninhabited, uninhabited plain or steep or grassland around Jerusalem, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin, verse 5. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. That's not just John making some sort of odd fashion statement. It is a very intentional connection with prophets of old, including Elijah, who is described in 2 Kings 1, 8 in this way. He had a, a garment of animal hair and had a leather belt around his waist. 
John also, in addition to having a prophet's strange wardrobe, consumed a prophet's diet. He ate locust and wild honey. Verse 7. And he proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is come. I am is coming after me. And I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So as the gospel is our primary preaching text for this week, as I so often say here in the pastor study, tune in to the recorded worship this Sunday from Cross of Christ Lutheran Church in beautiful Bellevue, Washington, via YouTube, and you will hear the rest of the story. And for those of you who are uh, have enough seniority, you may appreciate that reference to the radio newsman, Paul Harvey. For now, this is our study for this week. So thanks for spending this time with me in my study and in God's word. I'll look forward to the next time we're in study together. And until then, peace be with you. So long.